that uh, I picked up a book by Heinz Pagels called The Cosmic Code, and it was about quantum physics. I had no idea about quantum physics, really, because as a biologist, I was just lucky enough to get through physics in school. <laughs> and so, I, but it turned out that I realized that not only myself, but every one of my colleagues was only programmed with what is called Newtonian or you know, classical physics, which is a world based on material reality. That they didn't understand anything about quantum physics, neither did I, but as I started to read the book, I was totally shocked because the simple truth is this. Physics is the primal science. If you want to study biology, you've got to know physics before you know biology. And I started to go back and I realized not only did I not know it, everyone in my field had no understanding of this physics. And the first thing the new physics said is, it's not the physical reality where the information is. It's in the field, the invisible stuff. And all of a sudden, it was like that jumped me uh, from my mechanical material world idea into entertaining the concept of the invisible force as being more powerful. And, then, and, and what it ultimately brought to me was the concept of spirituality, which I didn't believe in. And I, I actually got into science to avoid uh, the spiritual stuff. Uh, you know, and it's interesting because when you're growing up and you, and you hear these people give all this wonderful spiritual wisdom, and then as a kid you look at their lives, and even as a kid you go, geez, well, you know, that doesn't work for that guy very well, so why should you listen to that? Um, and so I really went into science because I thought that's where I'm going to find all these truths uh, to, to make sense out of my world. And, and the joke for me was, when I finally got to the awareness and I was already a tenured faculty member, I realized I was teaching religion uh, as much as I was teaching science. And that's because we were, we were just teaching dogmatic beliefs based on what everybody, you know, like a show of hands. How many people want to believe in this? Oh, that's enough people, so that's a rule. And uh, <laughs> so the issue about that is that um, I started to realize is that we were completely misunderstanding the nature of the game and that you cannot, you cannot live in this world without understanding first the mechanisms of the quantum mechanics, which is the foundation. And it's kind of weird because that's that weird science. You know, that's the one that's, it's a particle, it's a wave. How can it be both? And that's, that's the nature of the game. And yet, the moment you bring that science into this field of biology that we're talking about, all the problems that we're really basically facing in the world today start to sort themselves out in much better solutions and resolutions than the mechanical drug pharmaceutical industry answer to, to the issues. And, and it's an unfortunate situation because my perception of it now is that this has been perhaps one of the biggest destructive events in biomedicine is their collusion with pharmaceutical industry. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, I agree with you. I find that the surprising thing for me was that while in the 20th century physics had become more open, discovering more and more weird things, quantum theory, indeterminacy, um, you know, all the different wave particle duality, quantum non-locality, in cosmology, weird phenomena like quasars, now multiple universes, uh, all this stuff was going on. Physics getting broader and broader and stranger and stranger. In the same period, throughout the 20th century, biology has gone in exactly the opposite direction. It started broad, and it's got narrower and narrower and narrower, right through the 20th century. As when I was an undergraduate, most biology was still semi-holistic. We still looked at living animals and plants. Not much, but I mean, the first thing... <laughs> You brought them into the lab, and they were alive for the first few minutes till you killed them. <laughs> um, but they don't even have that now. My son's just been studying biology at school, at high school in England. And in his whole course, it was all molecular biology. They didn't see a single living or dead organism. They don't even dissect yeah. things anymore. It's all just learning about molecules. Um, so I think that this extreme reductionist molecular biology thing has got worse, a lot worse, and made biology much narrower. And I saw this when I was, again, a student at Cambridge. I was in studying biochemistry, and we had a sp series of special seminars given by molecular biologists. And I was one of a hand-picked group invited in the evenings to hang out with Francis Crick and Sidney Brenner. Both of them got the Nobel Prize, both of them eminent Cambridge biologists. And they were trying to persuade us, the, who they thought was this group of 
promising biochemist to go into molecular biology. This was in 1963. And um, they explained their approach, and it was very clear. Francis Crick said, um, you know, we figured out the genetic code in 10 years. He said, we've understood the basic key to life in 10 years. There are two basic problems still unsolved, developmental biology and consciousness. He said, the only reason they haven't been solved so far is the people who are studying them just aren't smart enough. He said, I'm taking consciousness, Sidney Brenner's taking <laughs> developmental biology, and we'll have it figured out in 10 years in molecular terms. They believed this. It was a kind of evangelical crusade. They then persuaded um, grant-giving agencies, and later in the 70s and 80s, beginning then, um, investment companies to invest huge amounts in molecular biology, promising that sequencing the genome, the, the genetic modification of plants, all this kind of thing, would lead to huge uh, profits. And the Human Genome Project was invented as a political move, though biologists have always suffered from physics envy. And... Um, <laughs> and... Uh, and <laughs> And there was a debate in the uh, early 80s about physics has got big science, multi-billion dollar projects like atom smashers, colliders, and so forth, as well as all the stuff they had, space programs. Biology was still a kind of cottage industry. So they wanted some big project that would capture the imagination uh, that you could explain. It had to be something you could ex explain to President Reagan. Well, that limited your... <laughs> That, that limited the possibilities. And they, came up, they came up with the Human Genome Project. You know, it was big, it's human, it's a multi-billion dollar, it's the kind of thing that would be a milestone in history. You know, it had all the right things. It was a smart move. It then meant there was a huge amount of money, billions of dollars invested in it. Um, then this led to biotech companies and all sorts of... And if you have hundreds of billions of dollars invested in molecular biology, that means there's lots of jobs. If there's lots of jobs, universities have to train people for those jobs. And it swung the entire balance of biology right over to the molecular side. Universities, many of them hardly do any other biology now. So this was, a, I think, a, a deliberate thing with market forces uh, going along with it that has led to this tremendous distortion of biology in this reductionist direction. Of course, the Human Genome Project turned out to be a big disappointment. I mean, they were expecting that we'd all have by now you know, individualized medicine, all sorts of enormous benefits were supposed to flow. They didn't. And when the genome was finally sequenced, um, you know, the private genome company, Celera Genomics, that was going to patent hundreds of human genes and make lots of money out of patenting genes, headed by Craig Venter, um, in 2000, their, tra their, s their shares were trading at about $230 a share. Within a few months, they were about $8 a share. They're now $7 a share. And the, when people actually saw the results, and when they, they were, there was a tremendous anticlimax, a tremendous sense of disappointment. And I read an interview with Craig Venter, who at least has a good sense of humor. He said, I'm a guy that's made a million the hard way, by working my way down from a billion. <laughs> so so um, I think that this enormous boom in molecular biology leading to a tremendous distortion of the whole of biology um, might actually be coming to an end because it's, it's running into the ground. And one reason I think this is that... Um, Molecular biologists are now drowning in data. They've sequenced not just the human, but dozens of other genomes. There are computer databases stacked with these huge amounts of information. It's now easy to buy machines that do this. Every issue of Nature and Science, uh, the leading international journals, are crammed with full-page ads for sequencing machines, molecular biology, chemicals, and so forth. Um, they just don't know what to do with it. Now they think that by hiring computer experts and calling it bioinformatics, that somehow the answer will appear. But actually, the more smart guys in that field are realizing that just piling up detailed molecular data isn't going to work.
It, it was a, a real interesting, it, to me it was not a disappointment, it was a total failure of the system for this reason. That a, a very interesting point because uh, uh, Paul Silverman, one of the architects of the Human Genome Project, wrote, and I didn't know it myself because I was caught up in the field thinking, the Human Genome Project sounds like a good humanitarian kind of thing to do. Mm -hmm. And then I read what it was principled on, and it was really created by venture capitalists. Yes. And the reason for it was this. They anticipated that uh, they were gonna make gene, they were gonna make a list of all the genes in a human body. And so that any defect that anybody would ever have would be some way connected to a gene. And if they could identify every one of these genes, then that every one would be like a new drug uh, that they could use to treat anybody's particular illness. And when the project got off the ground, the venture capitalists were all excited because according to the model, it would take over 100,000 genes, maybe 150,000 genes to make a human. And of course, the venture capitalists, that's 150,000 new drugs. That's why everybody jumped on the bandwagon. They were going to patent them all. In fact, I think they have patented most all of the gene segments at this point. But the failure was, uh, and they didn't talk about it, which is always a fun part. Um, when the results came in, there ends up to be about 21,000 genes. And why this is relevant is that some of the smallest animals on this planet have about the exact same number of genes. And so the reality, there was no difference between uh, men and worms in this regard. Uh, and it really pulled the big, it just blew the bubble up because it was all, as you said, all the plans. As soon as we have this list of genes, we're gonna be able to fix everybody and anybody. And then the issue was not only were there 120,000 missing genes, but then they were complete void as how can you make a human with only 21,000 genes. There was, there was nothing even in their, in, their, in their thinking box of where you can, you had to get way out of the box to try to figure out how could you make a human with this. And the issue is when you put this much money into something, it's like a steamroller going downhill, gaining this momentum, you pass the finish line that says, okay, you lost the race, and yet the power of this thing is just <laughs> pushing on, <laughs> and we're still buying the same story if you pick up the newspapers about, oh, a gene that controls this and a gene that controls that, as if, like, nothing ever happened. It's like, same story, it, it, it just ignore the results. And the reality is, you cannot ignore the results, but there's so much money, as you said, in that genetic industry that uh, they, they're trying to keep this thing afloat, and yet the model is gone. Yes. The model is completely gone.